the end. So we're really gonna, you know, cover equine asthma, um, kind of what it is, what it isn't, you know, how do they get it, what's involved in it, uh, how do we treat it now, and I guess kind of some of the things what, what we've used in the past to treat it, and uh, some of the different protocols that are out there for uh, for using it. So they've changed the name. I mean, this happens lots of times in human medicine and veterinary medicine. I think equine asthma might hold the record book for the most names, though. Uh, when I went through vet school in Saskatoon, we all called it heaves. Um, and I think that's probably still a common, you know, nomenclature with a lot of horsemen. Uh, it went through the COPD, um, kind of from, from human terms. And then for quite a few years through the 90s and early 2000s um, and the last, you know, 10, 15 years, we used RAO, which is recurrent airway obstruction and IAD, inflammatory airway disease. So those were kind of two separate, two separate uh, types of it. But now when they, you know, they consult a lot with the human asthmatic specialists and there's a lot of working groups that, that all get together on the veterinary and the human side, because equine asthma is quite, um, has a lot of similarities to human asthma. So they've, they've turned it now equine asthma, which I agree with. I think that's going to simplify it. Uh, I think most of us either know someone with asthma, a family member or a friend, or may even have it yourself. And so I think you can, you know, kind of empathize with your horse and, and, and kind of get with the program a little better. So there's three types of asthma in horses. There's mild asthma, moderate asthma, and severe. Mild and moderate, they lump them together into one. And so there's the mild and moderate is one group, and that was with the old IAD. And then there's the severe equine asthma, which is the old RAO. And so you can see they've got it broken down there kind of briefly as the different things. So the mild and moderate is certainly a lot more common. And a lot of you that would have performance horses, no matter what discipline they're in, um, and these horses that cough, um, that's kind of the, the primary clinical sign and the primary, you know, light bulb moment going on that you might have a problem going on with your horse. So these are usually younger to middle-aged performance horses. They may have an occasional cough that's been going on for a few weeks. Um, they often cough when exercise, uh, you know, when they're out doing their uh, event. Um, and you may start noticing some poor performance or some exercise intolerance, again, depending on your discipline. Um, these kind of ebb and flow, um, they improve with time. Um, and they're hard to pick up uh, at rest. Like you could call your veterinarian out and your horse would look 100% normal. So typically these don't show up until you're working your horse. The severe asthma are often the ones you can diagnose, you know, walking into the shed row. They're often older horses, they cough a lot. I'm sure some of you have seen these where they just get their head outstretched and they cough, cough, cough. Um, they pretty well all have an exercise intolerance. Uh, dyspnea means they have difficulty breathing. So you see that, you know, the old horseman used to talk about that heave line that gets going underneath the ribs because these horses have a lot of trouble, just like human asthmatics, getting air out. And so they have to contract their abdomen and squeeze with their, their muscles of their, um, to get that air going out. And that's where you see that heave line. And then horses have had it for a long time. The muscles actually hypertrophy and enlarge. And you can see that uh, just when you walk up. So it, it, it certainly signs fluctuate and it comes and goes depending on the weather, depending on the feed. But uh, these horses are always having some sort of respiratory issues. Um, so like a lot of things, there's not just one, one thing that causes it. Environment is the number one thing you have to address, though. And, um, when, you know, when they look at historically what's, what's got it going in a lot of horses, it's, it's their environment. So it's dust, molds, gases in the environment. I think we've all been in some of those barns where the urine smell. I mean, you yourself, you notice that you just start, you know, kind of seizing up a little and have difficulty breathing. Well, imagine if you're a horse and you're living in that environment 24-7. Um, there's certainly a genetic aspect with some breeds. They found some warm blood breeds that uh, it's about 50% heritable within those breeds. And again, as horses get older, uh, we see it more commonly. Not too many bacteria are implicated in equine asthma, but there's a couple of viruses probably. And one of the more common ones would be called equine rhinitis virus. So it's not the rhino, the herpes virus. It, this is actually a cold virus of horses called equine rhinitis. And uh, influenza, they think if some horses get a really bad influenza at a young age, that can set them up too. And again, no different than, uh, than humans. RSV virus, they believe, is implicated in a lot of the uh, onset of early childhood asthma. 
But dust is the big thing that we need to control. And you folks have, I wouldn't say 100% control. If at your own place you do, but if you're at boarding facility, it's tougher to, it's tougher to manage because you're kind of uh, at the, at, I wouldn't say the mercy, but you're uh, whatever feed they're feeding, uh, however the dust is. And dust isn't a static uh, event in a barn, right? It ebbs and flows throughout the day. Um, there's different times of the um, of the calendar year. Will will, will it be worse? Uh, you know, summer with dust from uh, harvest or dust from a gravel road. Um, so you really need to critically evaluate your barn, and maybe it helps to have somebody else come in there, um, and and maybe come in just at first sunlight, and you can see that dust settling in the uh, down through the uh, down through the shed row. Um, horses that have you know have asthma at any degree when, when the people are, are sweeping out the barns, mucking the stalls, uh, raking the arena, this all gets dust going in your horse. So if you've got a horse that has asthma, whether it's in your own facility or a barn, you may have to make arrangements to try to get your horse outside when those events are happening during the day because that can certainly uh, irritate it. Um, I just listened to a webinar today from Dr. Renaud Lagoulet at, at Calgary here, who's one of the world experts. And, uh, you know, he said the invisible dust is, is the primary enemy. So it's the dust you can't see, these really small particulates. So under five microns that get in there. And dust isn't just dust, right? It's a lot of different things. We have the, the one name we call it, but you can see here, there's a lot of different uh, elements within that. And so that's something that, you know, if you can address that early on, you can prevent a lot of equine asthma. But certainly when your horse has equine asthma, a lot of your efforts have to go into controlling dust and uh, particulates that are getting into your horse's uh, lower airways. In parts of the southeast U.S., they also deal with something called summer pasture associated. And uh, so this happens down in, you know, Alabama, Mississippi, areas of Texas, Oklahoma, when it gets really hot, really humid, and uh, some of the subtropical grasses with fungi and moles that get going. We don't see that for obvious reasons here much in Alberta. But round hay bales are one of our real nemesis here in the prairies. Um, you can see there that bottom uh, um, line there says, if your horses are fed round bales at all, they're two times more likely to have severe equine asthma. Horses getting any type of hay versus horses that are being on a pelleted feed uh, or cubes are seven times more likely at some point to get equine asthma. And if you're kept outside in the prairies, uh, there's a lot of a lot of round bale feeding. I've got four horses here. I, I feed them a round bale, but I fork it over the fence. So um, that's still not as good as cubes. It's still not as good as small squares, but it's certainly uh, a lot better than you can see these horses here where uh, this ho these horses have netting. You see a lot of horses that are a lot of hays that just put in the, the round bale feeders. And these horses, we've all seen those pictures where they're buried you know, right up to their ears with their noses in that. 20 hours a day and so they're breathing in all that dust and a lot of those round bales also the outside layer too uh, can have a lot of molds and fungus in it as, as well so um, if you can address that or just be aware of that that, that is a risk factor um, that's important. So the diagnosis of equine asthma isn't very difficult it's not a real expensive uh, episode for your veterinarian to go through Really, with a good history and physical exam, they can start kind of going down the pathway of yay or nay. Um, and then they want to have a really good listen to the lungs and the chest. So they get the stethoscope out, listen to your horse at rest. Um, and then we do what's called a rebreathing exam, where you get a plastic bag and you put it over the horse's nose. And so it's usually a, you know, a bag that you'd use, the size of the bag you'd use for your household garbage and then uh, hold it away from the horse's nostrils. And this increases the CO2 that your horse is breathing in. And so the horse has to start breathing very deeply and your veterinarian will listen to some um, terms they call squeaks or rails or rattles or wheezes in all four quadrants of the lungs. So both sides, up high, down low. And uh, that's typically what you hear is it starts sounding like a musical symphony in your horse's airway. And normally a horse, you shouldn't, you shouldn't hear that. Uh, they probably want to put a scope down your horse and uh, evaluate the mucus in the trachea. And that's what these four pictures are showing here, where zero is a nice clean trachea with hardly any mucus. And you go up to number three and four there and five, and there's a lot more mucus avail uh, available there. Um, and then a BAL is the bronchoalveolar lavage is kind of the gold standard where they, uh, they put a tube um, 
in uh, down your horses uh, through the nostrils down into the trachea, and then they lodge it deep down into the airway, and then they flush in some sterile saline, aspirate it back. Uh, they'd sedate your horse for this. It's it's not that difficult a procedure to do. Um, and then they send that uh, sample away to a lab and they can look at it for the different uh, cell types. Um, Dr. Lagule spoke today that in some of these samples in the summer, he actually sees dust right down into the lungs of the horses, especially horses that have been near a, a dusty roadway or in a really dusty barn. So this dust gets right down into the airway. So typically they see a change in the inflammatory cells and uh, they can tell how long it's been going on. They can grade it as to mild, moderate or severe and then kind of give your veterinarian um, a different treatment plan uh, based on this BAL. So yeah, BAL stands for bronchoalveolar lavage, where you're just putting the tube down, flushing some fluid and, and bringing it back. And that's kind of the gold standard along with the physical exam and a history uh, of diagnosing it. So this was some work that Dr. Legulay did a few years ago. And some of you that are barrel racers, you may have had your horse involved in this. Uh, he took uh, 170 horses, at about six different barrel racings in Alberta, scoped them and did BALs uh, half hour or longer after they'd raced. And you can see here that about half of them had evidence of EIPH, which is bleeding, what we call you know bleeding in horses, grade one or higher. Every horse but one had tracheal mucus scores of one or higher. And so a normal horse should have zero. It should have a clean mucus. So one isn't bad, but two's getting up there where you're concerned. And you can see here, 75% uh, of them had tracheal mucus scores of two or higher. These are competitive horses. These were horses that were on the circuit barrel racing. Um, and then when they did a history, a third of the horses had a previous history of bleeding. A third of them coughed at rest. Uh, most of them coughed at work. And then a fair percentage had exercise intolerance and increased recovery times. And there's been some papers out there that have shown uh, poor performance in race horses with mucus scores of higher than two and uh, similar poor performance in sport horses with scores of higher or three. So uh, we know that mucus in an airway is not normal and we know when it gets up there into a higher amount that it causes issues in, uh, in performance. And this is just a similar paper that was presented at last year's American Association of Equine Practitioners just to show that it, it happens everywhere and it doesn't really matter what your discipline. These were barrel horses at, at a Texas vet clinic and you can see, again, they scoped them and did BALs, and they found bleeding in about a third of them, equine asthma in roughly a quarter of them, and then they found both bleeding and asthma in just under half of them. So, um, you know, that's kind of the beauty of getting these BALs and scoping done is you can precisely diagnose if it's one or the other, or some horses have, uh, have both. So equine asthma treatment is really threefold. So you've got to remove the triggering factor. And we, you know, we talked about that earlier and I can't stress that enough that you just can't rely on a drug for this. Any of you that are asthmatics, you know you have to control what situations you go in personally or your family members. And uh, it's no different than horses. So you've got to control the environment. And I've heard Dr. Lagule mention a couple of times, if you can address the hay, because that's where most of the horses get it. So if you can address the hay primarily, and, uh, you know, if you're on a, a bad hay or a round bale, change that. Try to go to uh, small squares or some of these horses that really have it, uh, you know, to some more involved degree, you've got to go to, uh, to hay cubes, those help. Uh, certainly soaking hay can help. Uh, you know, the weather we've gone through the last couple of weeks, you, you can't soak hay when it's 40 below. So that's kind of a, a non-starter. So, um, you know, a lot of people will go to cubes. Uh, the the bedding in the in the stalls is critical too. You've got to address that. And straw is 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 very bad for most of these horses. So if you can go to a wood shavings or even a clean a clean stall, um, you know that that is a help as well. Uh, there's a, a a device out of uh, Quebec that's called sold called the Nutrafoin, and it's actually kind of acts like a small tub grinder where you can put a bale in it. It grinds it up and it mixes it with canola oil. And so then it spits out, uh, you know, your bale that's kind of been chewed up into four to five inch pieces of hay with an oil on it to keep the, keep the dust down. And then there's hay steamers you can get to. And so all these are expensive. They all take time. But uh, um, the big thing, if you control, really address the, the feed your horse is getting and the environment you're in, uh, that's critical. Second is control airway inflammation. And that's where corticosteroids come in. 
And then third is uh, help with bronchodilation. So these horses, their airways get bronchoconstricted, they get narrow. And uh, so there's some drugs we'll use for bronchodilators, but that's kind of your three-step therapy. And that's the same way they address human asthma too, is it's environment first, corticosteroids for the bronco, for the airway inflammation, and then uh, control the bronchoconstriction uh, with, bron with uh, bronchodilators. Yeah, and so here's just uh, some of the things we've talked about already. Um, I won't belabor this. I feel like I always go on too long about this, but it's it's critical. Um, you know, I tell people if you can't address this or you're not going to address it, there's no sense hardly even treating your horse because it, it's going to come back. Uh, we know it comes back, and uh, in horses that have it to a severe degree, uh, it comes back. It come back really hard. So the goals of corticosteroids or glucocorticoids, same, same thing, is to reduce the inflammation in the lungs. And uh, so there's some different drugs we've used over the years. So we used oral drugs, um, mainly uh, powdered dexamethasone. Some of you may have used this, used that. Uh, there's an injectable dexamethasone and some other corticosteroids that either can go intravenously or intramuscularly. And they work pretty well. Like dexamethasone is a, is a good drug. It works very well, but it's got some untoward side effects we'll talk in a bit. And then the inhalation therapies have certainly caught on over the last decade or two where these, the MDIs are the human puffers that we're all familiar with. Some of you would use those for yourself and some of you would use those with your horses. And there's different types of puffers. There's different types of corticosteroids and some of them are bronchodilators. Um, some of you may have the nebulizers that uh, uh, you can purchase and, and hook up to your horse and, and, and nebulize your horse with different drugs. Again, there's some issues with that we'll talk about in a bit. And then there's just been a recent drug uh, approved for, the first drug that's approved for equine asthma called the Acervo Equihaler. And I'll talk about that. And it's got what's called soft mist technology. So some of you may have heard of this. You may have seen it. You may even be using it yourself on your horses. So it's the, uh, it's a new drug for horses. Um, they work, Boringer, the company I work with, worked for 10 years to get this developed. Um, so seclesonide is the drug. And you needed two things to make this happen. Um, you needed uh, what's called the softness technology. So it breaks that drug down to a small uh, under five microns so it can get into the lungs where it works. And then you also needed a really unique corticosteroid that was effective yet didn't cause the side effects of what we see with, uh, with dexamethasone. And that's the beauty of these two, of this drug. It combines both of them. Um, the seclesonide and the softness technology. And the human, um, uh, the human uh, asthma specialists are quite, are quite envious of us in veterinary medicine because seclesonide is a wonderful corticosteroid. It's, I'll talk about it in a bit why it's so good. They don't have a seclesonide with softness on the human side. There's been some human asthmatic doctors that are not too happy that this came out first in veterinary medicine uh, before uh, human medicine, but I, I think it's great for us. So one of the really cool things about seclesonide is it, it's what's called a prodrug. So these are drugs that have little or no activity on their own. So something has to happen to them to twig them, to get them activated. And where this gets activated is in the lung epithelium. So in the lining of the lung cells deep down into the airway, into the terminal alveoli. So your horse breathes in the seclesonide, uh, which is in the servo. And then it gets converted to a big long drug there. We just call it desiclesonide. And this is the one that's extremely active that binds to the receptors in the lungs and treats your horse. So it's, um, it's an amazing drug actually how it works. So it's 10 times more potent than dexamethasone, uh, the desiclesonide, and, and we know how well dexamethasone works. So this is 10 times more potent. And because it's a prodrug, so your horse is breathing in, you know, the drug, the, the seclesonide that's in the acervo, and some of that get to, gets deposited in the back of the throat. Some horses will swallow it, but it can't get converted to the active drug because that only happens in the lung epithelial cells. And so that's why there's no uh, cortisol suppression, which is the real side effect, kind of the real bugaboo. We worry about treating horses with dexamethasone and some of the corticosteroids. You always worry as a veterinarian and a horse owner when you put your horse on dexamethasone is that gonna be the horse that founders on you? I know when I, I was in practice nine years as an equine vet here in Alberta, and every time I left the farm and I put a horse on dexamethasone, I kind of said a little prayer that I hope that isn't the horse that founders because it, it doesn't happen that commonly, 
but it does happen for sure. And every veterinarian, you're taught that in vet school, it's kind of drilled into your head and you worry about it. So this death cyclesonide, this is just showing, so this blue molecule here um, would be the cyclesonide and these would be the lung, uh, the villi in the, in the lungs. Uh, it gets brought into the, into the cell there and you can see it get, gets uptake. And there's an enzyme there called esterase that then cleaves this drug uh, and, it, and some of it is, remains as cyclesonide, which is the blue molecule there. Uh, most of it gets converted to desiclesonide, which is the green molecule. And then it binds to the receptors and goes to work and, and causes the potent anti-inflammatory effect you want without the side effect of the, uh, of the uh, drug. So this is the device, the servo equihaler, and you can see it's got a handle. Um, you insert it into the left nostril of the horse. Uh, you prime that once, uh, full prime, and there's a spring in there uh, that uh, right in the hat, right in the handle there that uh, drives the uh, drug up into the uh, into a valve at the top. And then when you depress that handle partway the second time, that releases the drug and it flows up through the uh, nasal adapter into the nostril of the horse. So it's designed to give uh, into the left nostril of the horse. Um, and uh, yeah, here's just a close up that shows the inside of that handle. Uh, where the cartridge is, the spring, and then in the middle of that, you can see it drives the drug up through that. And then when it's released, it comes out as that fine spray. And you can see that. Um, I've actually got one here with me. I'll, when I finish this, I'll, uh, I'll just show how it, uh, how it works. So yeah, it's some real key factors to it. It's got this really fine particle size, so under five microns, which gets down to it. And that's one of the issues with a lot of the um, other products you can buy on the market is there 10 microns and, and larger and uh, very little of that gets down into the lungs where it needs to where it needs to work. They think a lot of those are 10 to 15% is all of that drug that would get down into the lungs where um, the servo equihaler is in the 90% range. It's got a nice slow stream, so it's easy for the horse to breathe in. Um, and that compares to those human MDIs. Uh, I'm sure some of you have tried to use those and try to time your breathing. And it's tough, and a lot of that gets deposited in the back of the throat, and it's the same. It's the same with a horse. Uh, there's no CFCs in here, so it's all mechanically driven with the spring, so uh, you don't have to worry about greenhouse gases. And then it's extremely accurate as far as the dosing accuracy. Um, and so, yeah, this is just showing that 90% of these particles are the fine size, and they get down right into the bottom of the lung where it needs to where it needs to uh, uh, to work. If they're too large. You can see particles over 10 microns in size. A lot of those just get deposited up in the, in the, in the nose and the nasal pharynx. Uh, the six to 10 microns, a lot of those will just end up settling out kind of in the, uh, in the trachea, uh, heading down into the lungs. Uh, but that isn't where equine asthma, you need the treatment. You need it right down deep into the lungs, into these small little cells or sacs called the alveoli. And that's where this drug, uh, this drug gets to. So there's a uh, QR code on the box that you can scan with your phone and it takes you right to this equihaler.com and it's got some videos. Um, there's a really good uh, behaviorist uh, from the UK, Dr. Gemma Pearson, that there's a video you can watch. So if you, if you go on YouTube and just Google a servo equihaler, there's a lots of training material there. Uh, we've got a website, servoequihaler.ca. Um, and then there's a recycling program for the device. They're, it's designed to be used over 10 days. I've got a slide coming up for that. And then the device is recycled. Uh, so there isn't, there isn't just a cylinder that you can put in it, um, but the, the devices are recycled and 50% of them already are made from recycled material. And then 50% of that gets uh, recycled. Uh, our colleagues in the US are putting together a working group um, with key opinion leaders. We've already done that with an equine endocrinology group to support PPID and EMS. Um, and we're doing the same with a bunch of the uh, the, the key internal medicine specialists in the States. Um, this just shows uh, the soft mist technology. It just shows you the nice flow, slow spray that's going up there. And so you can see how easy that is for a horse, uh, you know, to breathe that in when it goes through the nasal, through the nasal adapter. So it's got, it's extremely accurate, the dose. Um, uh, there's little risk of having problems. Uh, I know when I first used this, we had a training program for, for my colleagues from the U.S. and our Canadian vets. And I, I live at uh, just northwest of Calgary on a ranch. And so we grabbed my four horses and, and used them. And 
Uh, I wasn't sure. To be honest, when I first saw this, I think like a lot of people, like, I don't know if my horse is going to accept that. And we, there was about 15 of us and each of us, I think, did it about four times to the horses. So we had like 60 uh, activations with the horses and we had no issues at all. So um, it's actually extremely easy to use in, in the majority of horses. So it's a, uh, it's a 10 day treatment program. Uh, days one to five, you do eight puffs twice a day. And then on day six, you change it over to 12 puffs once a day. And so uh, you use 140 puffs up over those, uh, over those 10 days. There's 160, you know, puffs, we call them within the container. So you've got some extra ones to use for a few extra days, or, you know, let's face it, the auto horse is going to throw their nose, throw their head, or you may have trouble with the timing to get it in. Um, but yeah, so there's 140 puffs you need to give that horse over, over 10 days. And most owners really start noticing a difference by day three. Um, it's like I said, it works extremely well. And if you can, uh, if you can control your environment or manage your environment, a lot of horses would only need one of these as servos a year. Um, a horse that, uh, you know, got back into some dust or had some problems, uh, you know, you might need, you might have to even go with, with a, a couple of these a year, two or three of these a year, but the majority of horses that we've had extremely good feedback. I mean, this drug is, is so effective and it's so safe. This was the, we did large safety studies in Europe and another one in the United States. We had uh, close to 300 horses in each study. And again, like I said, there's no other product that's approved for equine asthma. Everything else has been used off label. There's a lot of different little cookbook. I've tried this program. I've tried this program, but this is the only drug that's been tested and approved. It's approved around the world. Um, we got it approved a little over a year ago in Canada, um, and we used the U.S. Uh, the U.S. safety study, but uh, it decreased the uh, you know WCS stands for weighted clinical scores, and so that looked at stuff like coughing. Uh, breathing, uh, nasal discharge, uh, blood parameters, et cetera. And so it decreased it for all nine parameters by over five points for each parameter. 93% um, of the horses accepted the treatment. So that's going to be seven, of a, seven out of 100 that doesn't. So there's going to be the odd horse that doesn't. And I've had a couple phone calls already with people that have had trouble with their horse, but by far the majority uh, worked fine. And 95% of the owners were happy with it. So that's probably the proof in the pudding there is, you know, you guys are spending your money on it and, uh, and, and that's how it comes back. So this was just the, yeah, the, the study that got it approved that showed it was safe and showed it was effective. Um, so they took a group of horses, you can see here, and they went up to 100 days because they wanted to see what happens if you had horses on it for long term. Again, there was no cortisol suppression in these horses even being on it for 100 days. Um, the first 10 days of the study, the horses couldn't get any other drugs. So the owners had to consent. Um, and again, some of these were, were older horses, obviously. And so some of these horses would have been horses that would have typically been getting butte. There was some PPID horses in here. Uh, there was some equine metabolic horses in here. But for the first 10 days, all they could, all they could get was the acerbo. After that, for the remaining 90 days of some of the horses that were on the studies, they were allowed to go on whatever drug they were on to begin with. And, uh, and it was safe. So we've got horses that have had uh, PPID and... and uh, equine asthma that are that are on this safely and there's just a picture of a future well not a future i guess she's a horse owner now and that's kind of how the product is designed to be give you stand on the left side of the horse you would get your hand and, and put that over the bridge of the nose and control it and then just slowly uh, introduce that and start giving your, your treatment it doesn't take long it's probably about you know two to three minutes um to administer the uh the puffs to the horse um We've got some little treats. We give some of the horses as positive reinforcement. That was some of the lessons that came out of this Dr. Gemma Pearson video in the UK is positive reinforcement for these horses, especially when you start, you want to start slow and introduce it. You just don't want to come up and kind of cowboy it in and, and start, start clicking away. Um, so we just got a 48 hour race withdrawal approved in Canada here for it. That took quite a while for our racing authority to do. And that's the same as the U.S. They've got a 48-hour withdrawal. Equine Canada is going to allow this medication pending their withdrawal times. And the FEI, I don't know if they'll ever allow it. Um, it was banned completely. You couldn't use it at all. And now it's called a controlled drug, but they still don't have a withdrawal time for it. 
and I don't know if they will, but for racing and for Equine Canada, uh, it's it's good to go here. And obviously for, for a lot of the other events, barrel racing, et cetera, there are no, there are no drug with rules on that. So I guess that's it. Um, it's kind of a quick talk on equine asthma. I may just stop sharing and I'll just uh, bring in my, my horse dummy here if I can. So these are a really good looking realistic dummy that we had made up in, uh, what is it? we had made up in England. I called mine grated coconut after the great buck and horse of the Calgary Stampede. So you can see it's got a left nostril here that's patent. And so this is the box, the, uh, the servo equihaler box. And uh, this is the device here. So this is the servo equihaler. It's got a good little, uh, yeah, I just want to show you the QR code on the box. And so if you scan that with your phone, that takes you right to the website with all the information. And then for those of you, um, that like a booklet, a manual, it's got that in there too. So really take your time and go through this the first time you get it. Um, the big bugaboo on this is this handle here has to be depressed fully all the way in when you first get it and you first start administering it because that's what pierces the canister. And if you don't depress that all the way in, you've just wasted your money and, and you can't undo it. So you only get one chance to do that. So you have to depress that all the way in and then when you first set it up, you hold the handle once and then depress it half, once, half, once, half, and then the mist will start coming out. Um, so you do that three times, a full pull, half pull, do that three times, and then that's all you have to do that. And then when you administer that to the horse, you know, you put your hand over the brow of the horse, you come in with your elbow up uh, high in the air, we call it kind of the chicken wing technique, so this is lateral depress it into the horse's nostril, then we usually rotate down, and then you just start going through the, uh, going through the sequence here. Let's move my camera back. So yeah, so then you just full pull, half pull to release it. And you can see the mist. This is an older device, so you can't see the mist near as clearly, but you can physically see the device, or the mist in it. And then this is called the rebreathing. Uh, and this goes in and out as the horses breathe, so you can time that. It's not that critical because once you've got that sealed in there and the mist is in the chamber, it can't go anywhere. And so you just hold it there. And then once the horse starts breathing, and so as I said, it's eight puffs twice a day uh, for five days and then 12 puffs once a day for five days. So it's uh, we usually encourage the clinics to kind of help help you guys set that up and, uh, and get it going initially. And then uh, after that, um, you know, you just use that uh, for the next 10 days on your horse and uh, again really really deal with the environment as best you can. So we'll maybe open it up now with uh, any questions or uh, comments that you might have and uh, we can have a visit for a bit. Awesome well thank you for such a great presentation and I uh, love grated coconut and I love the name choice. <laughs> That's a great visual for uh, for everyone. I know that definitely helped me. I'm a visual learner. So seeing that not just on the screen, but seeing you actually demonstrate how to do that, that was fantastic. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, and again, there's some excellent videos and stuff. I, I've been with Boring a long time and I've never seen a product that got released that's got more information as to how to use it and how not to use it um you know for you folks to go through and get comfortable with and even if you're not going to use it initially or you don't think you're going to use it there's some cool videos on there that uh that, that demonstrate how to use it that's awesome you definitely had a very thorough presentation a lot of information to take in but really uh really great really interesting product so that's fantastic doesn't look like so far we've got any questions Okay, maybe I'll just demonstrate one other thing while I've got it here, if anyone has a question. So this device can actually come apart, this nose piece. It just, it screws in here. And so if you need to wash this, let's say you get a horse that's got a really snotty nose or it gets dropped in the mud, you can actually take this apart and run some hot water through it and then just let it air dry. And then it's got threads in it. You just 
thread it back in. It may take you a little practice to get that done. I've done that quite a few times and that can, and that can happen, but you can wash this. Don't use, you know, don't use soap or anything on it, just some hot water. And the other thing we've had happen a couple of times, if you get a horse that really snorts and blows back in, they can blow this right off. So they can blow that nasal piece, um, the rebreathing right there. But it, again, it goes back in, there's a little lip on that and you can just put it back on quite easy there with that, so. Perfect, all right, we do have a question. Are oral antibiotics needed in a horse that has nasal, nasal discharge, oh, my screen, uh, and coughing? I've just got one of these devices from my vet for my quarter horse gelding with asthma. Yeah, so mo good question. Most of them don't have a bacterial component. That would be very uncommon. Um, uh, they have some nasal discharge just because they have some mucus down in their in their uh, in their airway, and so they're coughing, getting rid of that. And sometimes they can have a little bit of discoloration. If you had stuff that was obviously purulent, like pussy looking, um, uh, then certainly talk to your veterinary. But the vast majority of horses would not need an antibiotic, and it would be contraindicated. I know in the old days, you know, and even when I was a first vet, you know, people would come in and the horses were coughing, and they wanted pen strap you know they wanted to, they wanted to give them something to thought it would help but this isn't a this isn't an infectious disease this is a, a disease of uh, uh, airway inflammation from uh, environmental factors super great question and so then some of the other drugs like i talked a bit about bronchodilators and so um probably the most common drug that you guys would be familiar with is ventipulmin and so that's uh, you know that a liquid pump that you would put on the on top dress the horse's feed, and uh, you know again you wouldn't want your horse on that forever, but you could get one bottle of that, and, and some some veterinarians may want you to do that at the same time that you start with the acervo to get rid of the bronchoconstriction. Some veterinarians may just want you to uh, start out with the acervo equihaler and see how that goes, and maybe if after five days your horse was still coughing and uh still wasn't responding then you may want to start the ventipulmin at that time so that's something else uh, you know you can talk to your veterinarian about. and then the other drug that we see some veterinarians starting them on again because there's tracheal mucus there is a drug like sputolysin which is a, a mucolytic uh they don't have that drug in the states so we've got a bit of an advantage up here in canada uh and that drug will help break up that mucus in the lungs and help it, it just makes it a lot more runny and so your horse can just, uh, it'll start coming out of the horse's nostril or it'll, it'll start swallowing it. So those are the two other drugs that some veterinarians will put them on at the same time as ventipulmin for the, to dilate the airways, get rid of the bronchoconstriction and sterilize it with the Perfect. I definitely wish we had this uh, device 15 years ago when I had a horse that had real difficulties. So. I'm definitely going to be looking into one of these for myself now for my performance horses. We do have another question. Is it okay to give as needed, for example, going to the arena for a riding lesson? My horse is a pasture horse, but coughs at times when in an arena. Yeah, so good question. And that, so this drug is only approved for severe equine asthma because that's the one you can measure that and you can measure the degree your horse has it and then they can measure the response and so a lot it had to do with the approval process it's hard to get a drug approved for mild and moderate asthma for a, for a whole variety of reasons so um, off-label use you'd have to talk to your veterinarians about that um, there are some veterinarians that are using this in off off-label medications but um, for tonight's episode i can only talk about you know the on-label use of it for for severe equine asthma Perfect. Well, that answers those questions for her. Um, that is fantastic. Doesn't look like we've got any other questions. So thank you again, Dr. Myers, for joining us tonight and sharing all your wonderful information. And this recording will be available on our YouTube channel for uh, when all that information percolates and you want to revisit to see, uh, see the wonderful diagrams that he had and the wonderful information because it was a lot to take in. So look for it on our YouTube channel, Delaney Vet Services. Okay, thank you for organizing.